You're listening to the Joelle Martin Mastery Podcast, home of the two-hour deep dive interview with gold, platinum, and multi-platinum bands, including Stained, Blue Rodeo, The Arkells, Finger Eleven, Big Wreck, Moist, Bedouin Sound Clash, I Mother Earth, Ill Scarlet, Neverending White Lights, Thornley, and many more. Please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast as well as share, comment, and like. Now let's dive in to today's episode. Welcome, everyone, to today's episode of the podcast. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. We are joined by a very special guest. He is the winner of season five of Canadian Idol. He has a platinum single and a gold album on his long list of accomplishments. He's the host of the Beyond the Melody podcast. He's got new music in the pipeline for early 2023. And last but not least, he recently got married. So we have quite a bit to talk about. So welcome to the podcast, uh, making your triumphant return, yes. Brian Mello. Brian, how are you? And and how good does it feel to be working on new music? Well, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Nice to be here again, buddy. And, I'm, and before I get into it, just want to say how proud I am of you. Uh, just the hustle that you've been doing and and uh, and how you've been building this podcast has been fun to watch. So So thanks for having me back on. Uh, new music. It's been a long time coming. It's been a long time coming. So, um, I'm, I'm tremendously excited to get back out there and, um, and release new music. The funny thing is I've never stopped writing, you know, so I've just, I've, I had all this music forever, but just didn't get a really just the way the, just the way things unfolded, didn't get a chance to, to release it. So, you know, when I was, when I was, doing my sit in Nashville with my old band for those five years, it was strictly about the band. We were writing for the band and that's about five years right there. Just, just, um, you know, working on this, this group project. And then when I decided to come back home, uh, 2019, it was the first time in a while that I just picked up the guitar and started writing for myself again. And, uh, and then I basically haven't stopped since I got back home. So I've just been writing a ton and uh, so I have three songs in the pipeline. I'm actually going to go end of this month to record another one. And uh, I just want to be releasing a lot of music again, man. So uh, tentatively, the first single is going to be released in February. Which song that is, I'm not sure. Once I get the finished mixes, I'll have a better idea of uh, uh, which which horse takes the lead there. But but it's uh, uh, but it's been fun. It's been really fun. So yeah, you mentioned five years in Nashville, you get back to yeah. Hamilton in 2019. And then there's two years of this like little pandemic thing. So that makes yeah. it hard to release new music as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, it was funny too, because um, a lot of the songs, almost all the songs that I write these days, I, I write with my writing partner, Paul Stevens, and he's still out in Nashville. So when I came back home, him and I were doing the Zoom rights already, right? Because he's he's an incredible lyricist and he really knows how to help bring my ideas. Uh, uh, he knows how to land the plane with me, as we say. So um, so we were doing this, like what you and I are doing right now. You know, I'd, I'd have an idea. Him and I would, uh, you know, shoot it back and forth and we'd write these songs. So it was funny to see, you know, several months later when when everybody's like, oh my God, we got to do Zoom rights and we got to do, which is usually, you know, ideally you want to be in the same room with these writers we were we we're like man this is old news for us now this has kind of been our habit for the last little while so that wasn't different and um but it didn't the, the pandemic didn't slow down our writing I, I know i've talked to different musicians i'm sure you have on the pod where uh either you were writing a ton or you weren't writing at all it it, it just really depended on on the individual and where i was at i think the first month or two of the pandemic i wrote like 14 songs you know just constantly just just writing and writing and uh uh and then uh and then got into the studio last summer to start recording um and then like you said you know got married and there was all this other other stuff happening so so uh some things i i've like i've never met a deadline with my singles i've never <laughs> i've always ideally said okay you know fall of 2022 is when the music and i've just never been able to do it you know and uh, uh but but i feel good about february so i think i'll i think i'll meet that deadline maybe that's why with canadian idol they make you record that single in advance they're like <laughs> we're, yeah. we're gonna make him make that that deadline for sure yeah yeah exactly right yeah so so you, you mentioned that the the um 
the pandemic inspired you to to write a lot or it gave you more time to write a lot and you were saying some people was the opposite and uh a lot of musicians i talked to it it like wiped them out where basically you know with all this chaos in the world they felt like what what's the point like what is what do you know what are my little songs doing when all these people are are, are dying like they felt like it, it was unnecessary or they felt like you know maybe we're never going to be playing live shows again uh so you know they didn't feel the motivation because maybe i'm st stuck with my songs that are never going to see the light of day there was so it was weird there's two camps that uh you yeah. know huh. yeah i i i looked at it differently it it, it just uh just therapeutically it helped me and then that was that was my my release and i think uh just that creative brain i think is it's good to keep it stimulated in in, in creating different things so so for me i it, it just it kept things sharp for me and just kept on um uh you know just kept on the habit of writing because uh there it is a bit of a release for me i always felt better after a write you know, as far as if they were going to go out into the world or not. Uh, I mean, that's that, I usually don't write for that. I, I, I maybe that's the case down the line, you know, but for me, it's about just getting in there and creating something that I'm really proud of for the day. And then uh, and then where it goes after that, you know, we'll see. But but for me, it was just that outlet that I needed at the time. So I. I, I mentioned that uh, this is your triumphant return to the podcast. So you were on the podcast just over a year ago on episode 28. So this was October 7th, 2021. Uh, I could be wrong, but I believe this is episode 78. So this is 50 episodes ago, which is, wow. you know, about a year. And uh, for our listeners, that episode number 28 we did a two-hour deep dive your entire life growing up your 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 career we did everything yeah. um so if if people want to check that out go back to episode 28 and what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the the last year since that interview as well as what you have uh, upcoming so just okay. giving everyone everyone a heads up on that there's still lots to talk about and uh I wanted to kick off this episode powerfully. So I let my listeners know how we know each other. So in our case, we go back to Canadian Idol. You ended up winning the whole thing. And I was able to, to reach out to some of the other finalists that year. So I have some kind words from three... <laughs> three different top 14 finalists. So just to give you a, a trip down memory lane for a moment, oh, wow. and then we'll dive into some other stuff. So uh, I'm just going to go through all three of them. So from uh, the great and powerful Dwight Dion, he said, oh, my boy, yeah, this, I think he was top four finalists somewhere there, somewhere around there. Uh, yeah. Dwight says, Brian is by far the most down to earth and authentic guy I've met through music, just an incredible human being through and through. So that's Dwight Dion. Now we have, oh, okay. Greg Newfeld, he oh says, <laughs> he says, yo, a bunch of exclamation marks. Miss you, brother. Always admired you, my friend. Your talent is insane. This industry ain't easy. And I love your passion that you keep putting into it every damn day. Much love, my man. Much love. Greg Newfeld. And now we have uh, Liam Styles Chang. So he says, I met Brian over 10 years ago on Canadian Idol, and I was drawn to his positive personality and his dedication to his craft. I wish I had more time to get to know him. So that's Liam. Yeah, man. Oh, that's awesome, man. That's amazing. Uh, well, I send love to all three of those guys. Yeah, I, I was able to spend more time with Greg and Dwight, and I got those two were like my 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 best friends on the show. Those guys were were amazing and incredible artists. And uh, um, and Liam, yeah, Liam Liam left a little early, but he was uh, that guy was just like a burst of energy out there and uh and couldn't have been a a sweeter guy so i hope he's doing well uh that that's awesome man thank you for that that was really nice you're very welcome uh last idle question does it feel like 15 years ago <sighs> uh yes and no yes and no i uh it's crazy that it's 15 years it, but also like it, it, it in some days it feels like it was just like five years ago um 
but also I've experienced so much. I've grown so much since then. And a lot has happened uh, within those 15 years. Right. So um, I get reminded by my nephew. So a lot of people don't know that the day that I won, my sister was very, very pregnant. And the day that I won, my sister walked on stage, said, Bri, I love you. Congratulations. I'm going to the hospital. And she was in labor the moment that I won Idol. And a lot of people don't know this. And she uh, she went to the hospital. And the next day, my nephew, JT, was born. So he's a, he's a constant reminder of how quickly time's going. Because every time I look at JT and he's in grade 10 now, I'm like, oh, my God. Like, he was born the day after I won Idol. So so that's a constant reminder that we're getting older, buddy. But I I uh, uh, I love it, man. I, honestly, it, it was such a... It was such an awesome time, and I appreciate it even more now as time goes on and as I get older. <clears throat> Again, and, and the big things are, are like some of those guys that you mentioned. You know, you have uh, you have Greg, you have Dwight, uh, Carly Ray. Uh, there was Matt Rapley. There was there was like all these people um, that I got in close with. Uh, Kibway Thomas, who was in the band, who's still one of my best friends. Uh, he's actually going to be producing my my single that I wrote for my wife at the wedding uh, and that, that all those relationships came from that show, you know? So, so uh, I'm, I'm so grateful for that. Uh, yeah. That's, that's quite the time stamp to have your nephew born <laughs> right right there. So yeah. is, is he about 15 years older? Is my timeline way off? He's 15. He's 15. Ah, beauty. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So in, in the last interview that we did together, we, we covered from the very start of, of how you ended up gravitating towards a guitar. And it, it was a lot with your brothers as influences. Uh, there, there's a few questions I didn't get to ask uh, about the early years for you. So I want to ask a few of those and then we'll come to the, the present day timeline. So um, once you, you picked up a guitar, you were pretty young. Which guitarists were, were your biggest influences? Were, were there people on the radio or you're seeing videos on TV or maybe your your brothers or fi- your parents were playing music around the house? Any kind of guitar heroes that that drew you to that instrument or inspired you to practice and get better? Uh, you know, I'm a little bit different than other uh, other musicians, especially like guitarist friends of mine that are like lead guitarists, right? where they got drawn in by, you know, the Jimmy, the Jimi Hendrix, the Jimmy Page, Brian May, uh, Slash, like, like all these great, and so did I, I, their, their styles pulled me in, but I was always obsessed with songwriting, right? So I was writing all these songs with no music. And once I realized, wait a second, like they, they created these songs out of nothing. I, I, I have to go get a guitar and 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 put put music to these melodies that I had. So I I got drawn to go get an acoustic and it was a shitty little like like Bravo acoustic from a pawn shop somewhere. I should have brought my brothers when I bought this thing cuz it wasn't a great guitar, but I got to learn 3 4 chords and I started to write music. So I used guitar more as a tool um where a lot of my friends they got they gravitated towards the guitar because of the riffs and and and, um, and you know some of those guitar heroes that they have. Where for me it was a tad different. I was it was the songwriters that really pulled me in. I think we're similar in that sense as guitarists. Where uh, yeah. I have friends where it's all about learning crazy guitar solos and making crazy guitar solos. And for me, I I would take having written a great song over coming up with a great guitar solo any day of yeah. the week. Yeah, I, I tried to. I just tried to use the guitar as a tool to finish these songs because um, they. I just had melodies. I was always addicted to melodies and hooks and you know lyrics. Um, and and even till this day, like I, I I'm not going and trying to learn all these riffs. I'm I'm very blessed to have a lot of really great musicians that that uh, accompany me on stage and really you know elevate and that that helps. But. Uh, but I'm a bit of a strummer's McGee over here. I just, you know, I just try to, you know, I, I hold down the rhythm and I sing the songs and that's kind of where my world is. If, if I met you at 12 years old, who would I be meeting? What, what is Brian Mello like at oh, 12 man. years old? Who's, oh, that's who's a really that good, kid? That's a really good question. Uh, you would meet a shy kid that didn't know his potential yet. Um, uh, 
kind kid, you know. Uh, but uh, yeah, I I think uh, I was slowly starting to uh, come into my own and started getting a, a bit more uh, belief in myself. But I think that was probably twelve was probably right before that. Um, so I was I was a little shy. Um, and then if you were to talk to me when I was 13 or 14, it would be the different story where I was trying to be the life of the, the party in these, these classrooms and stuff. But 12 year old Brian was, was a little shy, uh, lacked a little bit of belief in myself. Uh, but, um, uh, but yeah, I, I, I think, uh, those coming years of, you know, I, my best friend to this day, um, I owe a lot of credit to him, uh, Kevin Craig. He um, he was the best man at my wedding. We've known each other since we were six years old. And he saw something in me before I saw something in myself. Like when I was six or seven years old, he was the complete opposite where like I kept him grounded a bit, but he just like pulled me out of my shell because, you know, when I was with him, I'd be really funny and and goofy and, and I'd, sh I'd show my true colors. But then when I was out in front of the class or whatever, I would kind of like. Uh, quiet down and not want to bother anybody. And he really helped pull me and break me out of my shell. And then once that happened, uh, you know, there was a lot of growth there for me, but, but it, it took a minute. And at 12, you're already into music. What other things were you into? Were you into hockey or video games or card collecting? Yes. Who is, uh, who is 12 year old Brian? <laughs> Mello? What were you into? Uh, yeah, it was sports and music. You know, and really, I mean, I'm wearing my Bears hat right now. So so some things uh, haven't changed. So I was a pretty good soccer player. So I uh, I played a lot of soccer. Uh, my two dreams growing up as a kid was either I'm going to hop on stage and, and go and sing rock songs for people, or I'm going to go play for Team Canada or Team Portugal <laughs> uh, as a soccer player. But uh, I don't think I had the talent for that. But I was, I was really into uh, family. Uh, sports, music, um, and uh, yeah, I mean that—that's—that's that's really what took my attention. Um, video games a little bit, you know what I mean. But uh, but for the most part, yeah, for the most part, it was just kind of getting outside ball hockey. Which I don't know about you, man. I just yeah, I don't see these kids out anymore playing like ball hockey in the park like we used to. I well, used they're to not even, they're not outside at all. They're, they're not in, outside they're at all, on, right? On, on their video games or their yeah. phones or their tablet. Kids these days, you it's know? kids these days, I tell you. But I was I was out playing hockey, basketball, soccer, I mean everything you could think of. And then and then running home and then putting my headphones on and trying to listen to, you know, whatever albums came from like Columbia House or something. <laughs> yeah, I I remember as a kid, it's like you would get home at, I don't know, three o'clock and you'd basically just go, go outside until it was time to eat. You know, yeah, you'd go out and, and meet other, hang out with other kids or play ball hockey or, yeah. I don't know, do random stuff outside. And, and then you'd come in to eat and then you could go back out again until maybe it was dark. It's, it's yeah. so different. Like when I, you know, watch, movies that are based they're like westerns or something where there's no technology yet no electricity and it's like they basically sit around and like drink together like the you know it's just yeah. it seems like such a different time and i i'm like man it's it, that would be kind of nice for it to be just so so simple and it's just about like connecting and and hanging out with people you know yeah yeah no i hear you i hear you man i uh um yeah my my child my childhood back then was I couldn't ask for a better childhood. Uh, so um, I, I, I miss that though. I, I do miss like people getting out there and, and connecting like they used to for sure. So you said 13, 14, you start to come into your own. If, yeah. if, if at 16 years old, you and I were <laughs> friends and yeah. you invite me over to your place, I'm, I'm assuming in Hamilton and, yeah. and we're going to listen to music. What albums would you be playing for me at 16? At 16 years old, uh, it's going to be a mixture of of rock and hip hop at that time. So let's see. I'm looking at the back. I've, of, I've never of, I've never heard you uh, talk about hip hop before. So I like this. Yeah. Yeah. I was uh, I used to do. I'm not saying that it was good, but I used to do a little bit of rapping, you know, and my uh my name was Killa B. <laughs> snappy, snappy. Yeah, I like yeah, a it. little, little, little snappy. Uh, but yeah, that '90s hip hop I loved. Uh, 16 years old. Um, 
I mean, so I'm listening to Pearl Jam. I'm listening to Incubus. I'm listening to the Chili's. I'm listening to Wu Tang. I'm listening to to Pac, Biggie. Um, that might be a year before M Eminem came in, but we were listening to that. Um, yeah, it it was it was a lot of that. It was a lot of like the the grunge music. Uh, what was happening at that time? I think when you're 16, I wasn't thinking about Zeppelin and Beatles and and all that stuff as much at that time. I think you're you're very impressionable with like the people that are around you. And so, um, so yeah, so it was the rock and hip hop that, that really got me at that time too. And, and now since then, uh, you've, you've had a lifetime of listening to music and listening to albums. Yeah. Uh, who would you say are your all time favorite artists? Oh man. Um, all time favorite artists, bands, um, I've listed a few, but I'd say, uh, um, Radiohead. I loved, um, Travis. I love, uh, there was a lot of like the Brit rock, the nineties Brit rock. I really loved, right. Cold, Even like, the old, old, yeah, the old school Coldplay. Um, and then, and then if, if I'm going to go back, then it's, uh, I mean, probably some of these people that you're seeing on the back wall here too. So it's like, um, like I said, the Beatles, I love Zeppelin. I love queen was huge for me. Queen was, was really big. Like that, that was, I was, that really pulled me in when my brothers had like the greatest hits album from queen that, uh, Freddie Mercury. I mean, that, that was massive. So queen is definitely up there. Um, I love John Mayer, man. Like John Mayer. Um, I just love his style. He's one of those guys. Like, you know, if you look at like, now with playlists and there's certain moods like he's one of those guys that doesn't really matter what mood i'm in he sits he suits the vibe i could put him in for like a dinner party i uh, i could put him in for like if i'm going for a walk in nature or if I, I could put him in for a, a road trip i could put like, like, like hey he, hey your body is a wonderland if you got to set the mood right I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> that's what i'm saying right yeah if you want to get a little bit more, more romantic he has those songs there for you too you know so he unintentionally i i would think he kind of like covers a lot of different vibes but so um i just love his songwriting and obviously his guitar playing um i mean honestly i could go on and on there's so many musicians that i admire um big wreck was big for me you know big wreck was uh I, I see them behind you there like um as far as canadian bands go uh, big wreck it, it was huge so yeah, I I say that. Yeah, John John Mayer, he he's also gone through a shift uh, in in style a lot over the years. Yeah. So you know he was the acoustic singer songwriter kind of pop. Then Continuum he gets into like the the b very bluesy. Yeah. Uh, since then with like Born and Raised, it's more of like the folk rock, like the southern rock. And uh, yeah, he's kind of done everything. You know. Yeah, even this new one's a bit more like retro synthy that's true like gives me that like dire straits kind of vibe to some of the music on his latest album yeah he's he's awesome he's he's one of those true artists that i i definitely respect we have uh we have a lot of the same favorite artists and uh <laughs> it's funny because you mentioned radiohead so you have radiohead that goes on to influence Coldplay, who's one of your favorites, who yeah. goes on to influence Travis. Like you can see kind of the progression yeah. of those bands, you know? Yeah, I think it, there's certain soundscapes that I'm attracted to. Um, so I, I've i always kind of had, it, I don't know, this alchemy of, of music from, from like the UK that really brought me in and also what was happening here in North America. But when you look at, uh, at like the British bands, like I love that that ambient telly sound that a lot of those, those tunes have. Right. And they, they add a lot of atmosphere there. Um, the riffs are parts, you know, they're very, they're very hooky. They're very uh, hypnotic that, that pulls me in. And then I look at like, you know, bands like, like our artists, like uh, Cheryl Crow's um, uh, like older stuff in uh, the wallflowers and uh, Tom Petty. And it's that middle America, type of acoustic rock that I, you know, I really love. And I've been listening to a lot of that lately too. And you have, you know, the beautiful organs and the B3s and, um, 
yeah, there's just, just, there's, there's so much, there's so much. Uh, and then, you know, Motown, I love listening to, you know, like Sam cook and, and I, I mean, I just love music. Like I just like, like just a music lover, you know, and there's, there's something that you can take away from every genre. So, um, I, I don't know. I, I kind of go in waves with what I'm listening to, depending on, you know, where I'm at. The uh, the vocal performance in Sam Cooke's uh, A Change Is Gonna Come Ugh. is like the best vocal performance of all time. And you're talking about the wallflowers. The snare yeah. sound in One Headlight is my favorite snare yeah. sound. Like when that comes on, holy crap, you know? Uh, yeah. Uh, one Headlight is one of those songs that just like, it doesn't matter if it was released tomorrow for the first time or it being released, you know, 25 years ago. I think it still would be a hit because just the song is so good, you know, and uh, you're right, man. There's just there's a beautiful pocket and a beautiful vibe in that song that just always pulls me in. Right. And I'm tr I'm trying to uh, with the singles that are coming out, I'm, I'm really trying to mimic those types of sounds. I find with these three singles, they're falling into that realm of, again, if I were to say like that petty wallflowers, um, Cheryl Crow um uh who like travis you know just that that kind of production i just I, I really love and uh try your best to mimic it and usually that that means that's involving tape which is where we're at right now is trying to get all the all the tracks that we've recorded through tape individually get it back and see if we can really get that that analog sound that i've been missing that's awesome. We're we're gonna dive deep into the uh, the upcoming album. I got I got lots of questions about uh, about those songs and that yeah, music. Yeah. Um, can you imagine being um, Jacob Dylan and your dad is Bob Dylan? Like, can you imagine? No, you know, from the Wallflowers. I mean, obviously, there's all the perks of having the greatest songwriter of all time as as your dad and those contacts and you know being the family is wealthy and there's there's all the benefits but can you imagine trying to get out of that shadow like there's nothing you can do despite he's sold millions of albums himself no no um i i those are big shoes to fill maybe the gonna, biggest maybe the biggest you're right uh and how do you 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 don't feel them you don't feel them. And how do you not compare the two? Right. But Jacob has done such a, a great job at creating his own lane and not trying to replicate his father in, in any way that, uh, I mean, he kind of, he, he came out of the gates with a fucking smash, you know? So, so that, that, that worked out for him. But funny enough, I had, um, uh, I had Neil Peart's niece on my podcast. It's going to be coming out pretty soon. And uh, she has a band by the name of the Savage Patch Kids. And she was telling me that uh, it's a great name too, right? The Savage Patch. <laughs> yeah. it, and she was, she was telling me that like some of these rush fans, uh, they're, they're, they're pretty like loyal and, and some of them are headstrong and some of them can be not saying that it's rush, but just any fan that is a fanatic uh, they can be uh, they can be pretty abrasive towards some people. So in her case, like she was trying not to use her name, you know, or the connection for, you know, being Neil Peart's um, niece. And when word got out that she was and she's putting music out there, there is there was all this this judgment and this criticism from these fans basically trying to call her a joke or saying, like, you know, you're never going to be as good as my your your uncle and. You know, all it was pretty nasty, you know, and uh, and there's people out there that, are, you know, are just looking for drama. But it, it took her a minute. It took her a minute. Right. So um, I, I don't envy that even when you, if, you know, going back to athletics, like you look at, um, you know, LeBron James son right now is 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 going to be going into the league and uh, you're he's going to get those comparisons with his father if, if he likes it or not. Right. But his father is a generational talent right so it's, it's not fair but society has a way of comparing if if you like it or not yeah so i had uh alfano bellini on the podcast from uh, envy of none so the album cover right here the blue one uh, yeah. so that's alex lifeson of rush that's his new super group and yeah. uh 
him, he, you know, uh, as a member of Rush, uh, you get all this backlash because it sounds nothing like Rush. Like it's a yeah. female, a young female singer songwriter is the singer. Uh, it's very kind of dark and droney. Like it's, um, I guess you could compare it to like garbage because of like a female okay. lead vocalist over darker rock music. And there's a lot of electronic elements, but uh, e even members of Rush themselves, Alex Lifeson, there's all this backlash like, oh, you go from the greatest band of all time to to this, which is great. It's a great album, but it's not Rush. Um, but it, like we mentioned, it's so tough. You know, there's there's just a handful of bands that have a fan base as rabid and dedicated as Rush. There's like, <laughs> you know, Tool maybe, like yeah. Nine Inch Nails maybe. There's just a few that have that insane fan base and Rush yeah. is definitely one of them. Yeah, yeah. I, I witnessed that firsthand. I um, they, they gave my wife and I uh, two tickets to uh, Neil Peart's memorial uh, and they were doing a, a concert there, which was run by the fans. Right. So a lot of a lot of the some of the fans are ones that brought him in. And and I, I, I like Rush, but I, I was not like, you know, it wasn't necessarily always playing in my house. So so I wouldn't call myself a diehard. But when I was there and I saw the fans, I mean, it's like, well, yeah, no, no wonder these guys, obviously, besides, you know, the great music they created. But no wonder these guys had such a great career. I mean, these fans will go wherever the hell you go uh, because they just, they, they love that band so much. Right. But like, yeah, it's almost like, uh, like, a, a, I, I like they, they would tell me like some of these rush fans would like corner would corner their, uh, the family members in the bathroom that they're not even, they're not even Neil or, or, you know, any of the members are like Getty Lee or any of them, but they would, if they knew you were a family member, they would corner you. Right. Uh, just because they're just these rabid fans and they, they don't, uh, you know, don't take into consideration, um, uh, your, your, your personal space. Right. So, so yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. And the, the influence that Rush had on future, uh, rock musicians is, is crazy. So last episode I had uh, Gordy Johnson of big sugar. And he said, uh, at 12 years old, him and his 12 year old friends heard that rush was coming to Detroit. So he was in Windsor. So these 12 year olds get on a bus and go into a different country. They go into the U S they go into Detroit and there's no online ticket master. So six months in advance, they go and they wait in line at the arena in Detroit to get tickets and come back. And them going to that show at 12 years old, I guess uh, the album Hemisphere had just come, come out. And they got back from that show and Gordy Johnson was like, this is what I'm doing with my life at 12 and goes on to lead Big Sugar and, you know. Unreal. Multi-platinum Canadian icon, all this stuff. So to show you the power that uh, that Rush has. Yeah, yeah. There's only a few bands that that have that kind of power, right? That when you when you think about it in history, and Rush was definitely one of them for sure. You you mentioned in your list of favorite uh, artists and bands, Queen. Uh, you actually had your own moment with Queen. Uh, yeah. Can you yeah. share that with our listeners that aren't familiar? That was a that was probably if that was me, that would be like the achievement of my lifetime, or at least yeah. like one of the most memorable moments. Well, it, it was funny when I was when I was on the show, um, they would have these like online playing, almost like playing cards on the website for the contestants. So it would say, you know, what your name is. It's kind of like those old like uh, hockey cards that, you know, you, you're playing like peewee hockey. You'd look and you you'd get to know the player a little bit. So, you know, what your name is, what your height is, uh, what what music you're into, what's your favorite song was one of the, the questions. And my answer at the time was The Show Must Go On by Queen. Love that song. So end up getting on the show. We're, we're going further. And then we hear, I think before we get into the top 10, actually probably even a bit earlier, we hear that Queen has been booked and that if you get to top seven, that you're going to get to perform and meet Brian May and Roger Taylor of Queen. Well, I like nearly shit myself when I, when I heard that and everybody knew how huge of a queen fan I was. And I remember people were rooting for me saying like, like, man, like we'll do everything we can to get you there. And I remember at that point, that was my goal. I didn't even care about winning the show. I was like, if I can just get to top seven and meet queen, I've won. I'm done. Like, see, like that was, that was my goal. 
And, uh, and I was lucky enough to get there and we had to go, it was the Cannon theater at the time in Toronto and we hopped on stage and I performed too much love will kill you. Uh, a song that Brian may wrote for, uh, for Freddie Mercury. And I sang it for him and Roger on stage. And, uh, and it was the first time that Brian heard that song in a while. And it was a really personal song for him. Right. And I sang it and they started to tear up and I was like, Oh my God. And he's like, man, he goes, you got me. And I was oh, okay. I, I could barely speak the English language at that point. <laughs> like I was just like fumbling my words. And, uh, and you know, they, they gave me some really great uh, advice. And the cool thing was where, why we were in the Cannon theater was when, because they had the, we will rock you Broadway show. Right. So the way they were going to come out and surprise the crowd was during the encore, all of a sudden Brian and Roger come out, they play uh, we will rock you, I think. But the next song, when they call the contestants from Idol and they call us on stage to sing with them, was The Show Must Go On, the exact song that I wrote on <laughs> on that little playing card thing. And they had me standing right because they knew I was a huge fan. So they had me standing right beside Brian. And uh, and I got to sing The Show Must Go On with Brian May and Roger Taylor. It was one of the greatest moments of my life, honestly. And then they had an after party and I got to talk with Brian for like, I swear it was 30, 40 minutes. And he gave us all his attention. It was, it was unbelievable. I, you know, he, there's a million people that wanted to talk to him, but he was there with me and he talked to me, gave me his email. And I sent him an email right after I won the show for some advice. And he uh, responded back with this really thoughtful message that I have framed in my office now. And means more to me now than it even did then because now I have perspective after being in this this wild industry for 15 years. Uh, he has uh, uh, that he'll never know how much of an impact that had him on on my journey. So uh, yeah, so that was that's my story about Queen. But but uh, yeah, just a pinch me moment. Definitely didn't see that in the cards <laughs> to actually be be uh, performing with Brian. It was it was crazy. I, I almost feel bad for the other performers because once they announce that, hey, if you can make the top seven, you'll be performing for or with Queen. I feel like there would be no denying you at that point. Like it, you would yeah. you would muster up whatever is needed to get there. And, I, I you know, it's like you had yeah. this uh, this uh, I don't know. You had something special, you know, they're give, gifted to you where yeah. th this is it. Like if this isn't meant for me you know like serendipity of like <laughs> of all the yeah. artists it's my favorite artist like how can i not be top seven you know yeah yeah man man i'll, I'll tell you man i was i was so focused uh during during that that time and there was a lot of contestants that would you know they would go online and and try to find out what people were saying about them on the this is when they had threads <laughs> on the on the threads on the canadian idol website and you know, for every comment that was nice about you, there's another like two or three of trying to, you know, trying to talk crap about you. So I, mine was out of sight, out of mind. And I, I would spend every waking hour just like working on those songs, uh, visualizing, meditating on it, you know, everything I could, any advantage I could find <laughs> to make sure that I would, I would go through and, and, and that helped. And, and I'm glad it led to that queen experience. Cause I honestly could have left after that and be like, Greg, you talked about Greg. I remember, uh, uh, was it Greg? No, no, no. Okay, I'm mixing it up because we had, we had Maroon Five. I was gonna say it was Queen, but he was there for Queen. It was the week that week. I guess Greg went home, and it was kind of like, it was like the very like controversial episode because was he, he was a I, front runner as a fan. Oh yeah, yeah, totally, man, totally. He was he was amazing. Greg was amazing. So, um, when uh. And that that week, it was Greg, myself, and Carly Rae Jepsen. All three of us were in the bottom. And then it was just Greg and I, which everyone knew him and I were like best buds on the show. So it sucked. It was like one of us are leaving, and and I I hated seeing him go, and I still don't. I think Ben Marooney made a whole fuss about it, saying Canada got it wrong, and he got like a bunch of like flack about it. But he was right; they got it wrong. He should have been there. Um, how and, how I, confident? How confident were you that you were going home at that point? With with uh, all the like, it was. A oh, I'm going home. Yeah. I'm, oh, I'm going home. I'm going home. Yeah. I, at that point, when it was when I was beside Greg, and at that point, he was he was the front runner. I was like, I'm going home. That that that's that's it for me. 
you know, and uh, but the next week he was a massive Maroon 5 fan. And the next week was Maroon 5. And oh, I remember man. feeling for him because he he couldn't he couldn't uh, perform for Maroon 5. But I think he could tell you better than me. I think they were nice enough to allow him to come back that week and like sit on like the the sound check and watch Maroon 5 perform. But uh but yeah, yeah, it it was it was a crazy experience, man. It's it it's just to go and, and think and, and look back to, to how, like you said earlier about like it being 15 years. I mean, that's, that's insane. But, uh, but yeah, those, those moments they'll, they'll last forever. Man, b- bottom three. And you're there with Greg, the front runner and, and yeah. Carly, who's the final female standing. And it's like, Crazy. you know, how are you not going home there? You know, that's going to be my <laughs> thoughts. Yeah. I, I yeah. feel like um, that moment where Greg gets cut is the equivalent of American Idol where Daughtry gets cut fourth. <laughs> uh, everyone thought he yeah. would win. And what they think is uh, everyone voting assumed Daughtry's just going to win the whole thing. So that week, basically nobody voted for Daughtry. Yeah. They voted for the two they thought would most likely get cut. They wanted one yeah. to stay. And Daughtry, you know, leaves but goes on to do, you know, one of the most successful idols, period. But uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I remember uh, earlier on the show, uh, there was a bunch of friends and family that wanted to get together uh, at a, a friend's restaurant and they were all going to vote after the show. So there was like 50 of them that all got together. And then what happened? You thought that they're going to be there voting. Oh, he's got it. He did a great job. He's got, and they're shooting the shit and they're talking. No one voted. And I was in the bottom that week. And, and thank God. Thank God it didn't happen. And then they said, okay, that's the last time that we actually throw a party. Let's just stay home and, <laughs> and vote for the guy. Right. So yeah, that, that can definitely happen. You have too much confidence in somebody. And I, I think that was the case for, uh, for Greg. And sometimes too, it's the market, right? Like East coast seems to vote really well for, uh, for the people um, in Alberta, they seem to vote really well out in BC. They always had a little bit more trouble getting people to, to go in and everyone's vote. Everyone's too for relaxed it. out there. Dude. Everyone's too relaxed, I guess. Yeah. But that, that always seemed to be the case. So. Yeah. The voting reminds me of sometimes there's controversy with like the Grammys or the Oscars. So for example, uh, with the Grammys, let's say for album of the year, let's say there's five albums. If two of them are similar they kind of get pitted against each other. So if yeah. you have, I don't know, random example, but if you have say Justin Bieber for album of the year and you have like Sean Mendez, like someone that's pretty similar, it's like the votes get split between the two. And then one of the other three end up winning because there's like a hip hop album that stands out. So it's like all the votes go, you know, towards that, or you have, I don't know, Adele, or you have something just, just different. So you, you get vote splitting and it happens the same thing with, uh, with movies. Let's say you have two superhero movies that are up for best picture. You know, if there was only one, it's like, there'd be a ton of votes that way. But with two, those votes that one would get, get split between two and those yeah. two don't have enough to beat one. Hopefully that makes sense. That was a weird explanation, but no, no, I, I know what you mean. The, the Grammys are a little strange too, because people can pay for their nominations, you know? So uh, a lot of labels will, will pay it. It's like 250 grand or 500 grand. And they can actually really push their artists up front just by paying for a nomination. That's what a lot of people don't know. So there's a lot of politics in it, you know, and it's, uh, I don't know. I don't know. It, 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 it all depends on how you're judging these things. What are you judging them by? If you're judging them by, just purely album sales, then I get that. I get that. And then, uh, but yeah, but for, for like the art and stuff like Eminem, for example, you know, Eminem never, he was always voted. I don't think he ever won like rap album of the year. Right. So he, okay. So for overall album of the year, most of his albums have been nominated, but he's never won. So it felt like he should have won for the Marshall, Marshall Mathers LP. Yeah. But back then he was so controversial and not yet considered an all-time great. Um, so he's many times been up for album of the year, but it's never won. But he's won yeah. best rap album. Like just for the rap category, he's won like five or six times. But As o- he, okay. overall, it's like they can't, you know, white America can't, <laughs> yeah. can't, you know, flip the switch on that one. Totally. And I know some of those bigger stars, their argument is, okay, are you just 
nominating me so you can have my butt in the seat so that it looks better for the camera that all these stars are here. But then, you know, you give it to, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm like Steely Dan. I think one like one and Steely Dan is amazing. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But it kind of came from like left field like years ago when when they went one. Right. So I guess it all comes down to how they're judging these things and uh, and like what the criteria is. Yeah, it's the the same thing that happened with Eminem has happened with Kanye West. So right now it's controversial to talk about Kanye West, but, um, you know, he's put out five or six of the all time greatest albums. And yeah. for all those six, he's won best rap album, same as Eminem. And he's always mm -hmm. up for best overall album, but he never wins. Like that's no. one of the reasons that he's. Oh, I mean, he's he's pissed off for a lot of reasons and uh, <laughs> he's pissed off a lot. But that's one thing that always got to him. I think he's mm -hmm. if he, I think he's the most Grammy winning artist of all time. He has like 34 Grammys. Like it's hard to get nominated for one Grammy. He's won like 34 Grammys. Who, Kanye? Kanye. And wow. he's and he's pissed because, you know, two, three, four, five of those should be for album of the year. And he's he's still never won. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyways, uh, so we've talked about some of your favorite uh, artists and bands of all time, uh, talking more specifically about favorite albums of all time. So we've already mentioned Queen Greatest Hits. I mean, that's yeah. a banger, like every song on there. Yeah. There's a lot of songs, isn't it? A, there's a double album of there's Greatest Hits. There's a double Hits. album. Yeah, yeah double yeah. album. And yeah, that one, I, again, I, I growing up, I was late to the party. So I, the first album I had at that point for Queen, my brothers had the double album for greatest hits so i'm hearing banger after banger after banger i was like this is unbelievable All right so so that one that one was was definitely big and then just the showmanship of freddie mercury and hearing his voice and i i loved how uh cinematic all of it sounded and you know you know going back to guitar players like brian may is one of those guys that are his signature it literally changed uh the music soundscape you know there's only a few guitarists that you can say that they you can still hear their influence in music today right brian may's there obviously jimmy page is there george harrison's there uh slash is 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 in there as van well halen. Too. van halen exactly eddie van halen so um but just the songs were and they were so different you know, like this thing called love to show must go on to Bohemian Rhapsody to we are the champions to radio, uh, uh, radio Gaga, you know, like, th th I mean, they're all so freaking different, you know, but, uh, but it was still that queen sound and not a lot of people can pull that off. And that Radio Gaga's song is the inspiration for Lady Gaga. For Lady Gaga, yeah. There you go. More, more, more influence right there. Uh, you, you mentioned to me previously that some of your other favorite albums, Radio had the Bends, the and bends, yeah. um, you had uh, Aerosmith uh, get a grip. Is get that a grip? One? Yeah, get a grip. What, what is yeah. it about those two albums that make make them all time greats for you? Get a grip is more nostalgic, so. That's the first album I ever bought with my own money. Mm. And that's when I would watch like the Alicia, Alicia uh, Silverstone like music videos that and, and their move and their 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 videos were like movies. And they just had I, I've always just loved like big choruses and big hooks. And you know, they had crazy and amazing. And and I was what, maybe 13 when that came out. So I, I was really impressionable. But that was my first album I ever bought and the first concert I ever went to was Aerosmith. Wow. How good, right? how good was that? I've never seen them live. Oh man. It was, it was amazing. And uh fuel opened up for them when no one knew who fuel was. I don't know if you remember fuel. Oh, dude, uh, they had lots, of, <laughs> lots of great songs. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so that one was great. And then there was something about, for me, the bends with, with Radiohead, there was just such a, such a great vibe from beginning to end and it was a mood it was a certain mood and his his uh his vocals are so haunting but they're still such beautiful melodies and i think uh, uh i think the guitar playing is is very underappreciated you know and and just the chord progressions that they have in a lot of their music 
but uh I, I, they just had these earworms on that that album for me that would just really pulled me in and it's one of those albums that i never get tired of it every time i listen to it i just i never get tired of it right so so that's that's another one of them it's hard for me to pick albums but like uh continuum from john Mayer, i loved you know i i just thought that I, one that's was, his best album yeah, yeah i i agree I agree. So, so that one, that one, I loved, I obviously, you know, you, you can go back to, to the classics. Um, but yeah, it, it's hard for me to just to pick, to pick one album. I, I feel like the way I was, was more, you know, I, there'd be a few songs on this album that I really liked and a few songs from this album. I, I kind of bounced around a little bit more, but, but uh, I mean, there's, there's a ton. There's a, how about you? What's some of your favorite albums? Well, let me let me with your Aerosmith story about buying that being that being the first album that you bought with your own money. Uh, that's yeah. a good one. Like that's a story worth sharing. Uh, I'm I'm going to make a confession right now that I've never told anybody that the the first album that I purchased with my own money. So this is embarrassing. So hold, you know, here we go. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know at the time that there was something known as singles. So back then when you bought, you could buy albums, but people actually bought singles. So it'd be the the song yeah. and then like a remix of the song and maybe another song. So there's two or three songs. So uh, back in the day, I was so young that Christina Aguilera, Genie in a Bottle came out. And with <laughs> yeah. that music video, I was like in love. Like this was like my future wife. Uh, <laughs> so I, I scrape all the money I have in the world together and I go to buy that album and I get home and there's only two or three songs uh, because I bought a single and I didn't know that existed. So I was heartbroken with my hard earned money. All I got back was maybe two songs. And uh, it's, it scarred me to the, to the, to this day. I think so that's this, what's <laughs> wrong with me today. Uh, the, the darkness that I feel inside at times is uh, me getting a single instead of an album with my money. So, yeah, totally. That's yeah. One of those moments. You, and, and it's a whole process at that time. You got to like rip the plastic off, you know, you sit down, you kind of set the mood. Okay. I'm going to listen to this album. And then, you're you're playing the same song on repeat for the next, <laughs> next yeah yeah you please. know i i just on repeat listen to genie in a bottle i suppose <laughs> but uh, for me uh favorite albums of all time uh rage against the machine the self-titled oh, debut yeah. album from 92 oh man uh pink floyd wish you were here uh, go ahead no i i just you just made me remind i can't believe i forgot about this one i'll i'll throw it in but I'll, but fin finish your thought and i'll let you know so Rage Against the Machine, self-titled yeah. debut, Pink Floyd, yeah. Wish You Were Here. Yeah. Um, I love Winter Sleep. So Winter Sleep's yeah. first two albums. So their second one is right there. Uh, Stained Break the Cycle was, uh, I was 16. And that's the yeah. first, al that's the first full album that meant something to me that I listened to it nonstop and, and yeah. kind of that, that teen angst, you know, that, that, that pain that Aaron Lewis emitted, I that spoke to me at, at that time at 16. Yeah. Um, John Mayer Continuum, uh, Radiohead. Uh, I, I love in rainbows. So most people go with beautiful. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mo most people go with OK um, Computer. OK right? Computer or yeah, the Benz. But uh, for me, yeah. in rainbows is is unbelievable. Uh, Ray Lamontang. Oh, so buddy. I know you like him. I love uh, Ray. Yeah. I like his first two albums. Yeah. And uh, I love Eminem. So the Marshall Mathers LP. Yeah. Uh, I got to throw that in there too. That's a good point. 36 yeah. Chambers from Wu Tang was a big one for me. Yeah. Um, a one I forgot to mention was I like Brandon Boyd from Incubus was a big influence on me at that time. So when, when Incubus Make Yourself came out, that was huge for me. So I, I, I got to throw that in there. Make yeah. yourself from, from Incubus. I, I probably pardon me, stellar drive. Like that was, yeah, that was the I big mean, breakthrough. Yeah. And then I remember cause right after high school, I was in like this, this band stoked 
And everybody was obsessed with, uh, we were basically an Incubus cover band. Like, we would, we would play some, I mean, we would play some, uh, some cover gigs. And I mean, we, uh, there'd probably be like six or seven Incubus songs <laughs> that night. Cause we just, we loved them so much, but there was uh, a make yourself uh DVD that they, they put out and, and we would play that thing on repeat. And so, so that, that one really, really sticks. Yeah make yourself was like the big mainstream breakthrough um yeah. but the next one morning that, view so morning oh, science view, yeah science? science the musicianship on science yeah. is is Certain state of green ridiculous yeah and yeah, nothing science. sounds like it like it's it's no. they got more mainstream and more hooks and more harmonies and yeah more pop and i'm not saying that in a bad way but science was like incubus was this entity that sounded like nothing else at the time like they were on yeah. um the family values tour with all these super heavy bands and uh so science was like a statement of a unique band you know i i remember my brother went on uh, he got free tickets to a concert to see the deftones and he he wasn't a deftones fan he just made a night out of it with some friends but before, uh, I think Incubus was just about to release Make Yourself. So he never heard of Incubus at all. And they, he goes, first song, you know, uh, Brandon Boyd's on the, on the congas. You know, they're doing this whole, uh, this whole percussion. My brother's a percussionist too, so he loved that. But, uh, and they put on this incredible set after that. And uh, I remember him coming, coming back to me and saying, dude, who the fuck is Incubus? These guys are amazing. And, uh, and then, and then it kind of took off from there. So I, I, I heard them when make yourself happen. And then I went backwards to science. So then I found out about science after the make yourself record. So that big rec album behind you, that was a big one. That was a big one. And now one of my, one of my dear friends, my old bass player is the bass player for, uh, from, uh, Dave McMillan. Uh, he's been with them for, for years now, but big rec was huge. And, I mean, they've they've had a great career, but I think they're so good that they they should be selling out stadiums. They should be w spoken in the same breath as the Foo Fighters and Oasis and all these big groups. They're they're that good that that they should have that kind of success. Yeah. So uh, a few months ago, I had their new drummer Seku Lamumba. Seku, uh, yeah. So he he's been with them. I guess on and off, right? Two, about two years now, he's been like an official member. But well, he was uh, with uh, Thornley too, right? He used to play he, with them. He when was he with Thornley, Thornley Bedouin yeah. Sound Clash, Serena yeah. Ryder. He played with Ben Kenny, the bass player of Incubus, for like eight years. Like it's crazy who this guy's played with. But yeah, uh, all that to say that they're they're doing insanely well now like now that oh, shows yeah. are back on they're playing like really big shows they have um a new album coming out big rec seven and they've released it as three eps with I know. five songs yeah. um so the full 15 song album is is on its way and and it's getting radio play so uh they're they're up and running right now and hopefully they keep like you said it should be a big household name so yeah well i mean they they are a household name in canada you know, and and they have been for a long time. You know, uh, their their music is well known, and they got a great fan base. I'm talking about like internationally, like yeah. in, like 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 Ian Thornley, like that guy is that guy's insane. He's absolutely insane. Like one of the greatest guitar players ever. The guy's amazing, right? And then you has that voice to match and his songwriting. Like the guy, the guy is crazy good. Crazy good. And I remember Dave telling me about that album behind you. Uh, those were all demos. Like those are all really, really, really good demos. So by the time he gets into the studio, these songs are pretty like he has a very clear vision of what he wants them to sound and feel like. And uh, they were so good that by the time they got into the studio, it was just like, let's mix and master this bad boy and put it out into the world. Right. So uh, crazy good. Yeah, Se Seku was saying that what's unbelievable is um, Big Rec was at the start, they were auditioning for singers and they couldn't find a great singer. And, he, you know, Ian Thornley's like, well, I guess I'll sing. And <laughs> to this day, he doesn't consider himself a singer. He considers himself a guitarist that by necessity yeah. ended up singing. And he has this wild, like Chris Cornell, like voice, you know, that most yeah. people don't have. So, yeah, which he hates. I heard he hates the comparison of of chris cornell 
I uh, not I I I just think because he does his own thing and doesn't want to. Yeah. But uh, but uh, you can't you can't get away from the fact that there's similarities there. Yeah, I heard that Chris Cornell is he's he's actually a huge Chris Cornell fan. So you know, yeah, it's not that he doesn't like Chris Cornell, but it's no, it's no, no. Maybe he didn't want to that get compares. that close vo- vocally <laughs> yeah. or something. But uh, you, you, so you mentioned your your friends with uh, a, a member of of Big Rec. You actually have a, a show coming up, don't you? Like a Christmas show, and he's playing in the band, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, man. Can you, yeah, we, can uh, you share that info with uh, our listeners? Because some of them are absolutely. in the GTA, man. They can come out to this. Yeah, yeah. We'd love to have you guys come out. Uh, and uh, and tickets are going fast too. But uh, I'm doing. Uh, it's the second year I've done it. It's the Brian Mello uh, Rocking Christmas Bash. It's going to be in Hamilton at uh, at Stonewalls, and uh, it's on December 9th. And basically, you can you can, you can call in and uh, reserve your table and just uh, pay at the door. But I have uh, an incredible band lined up with me here. So like you said, I have Dave McMillan from Big Rec playing bass. I have Andrew McTaggart, who plays with Tim Hicks and, uh, and Steven Tyler playing guitar. I have uh, Jesse O'Brien who's on keys. He's Colin James and Tom Wilson's keys player. I have uh, Allison Young, who is a Juno-nominated no- a Juno nominated, uh, saxophone player. She's played with Susie McNeil and Corey Hart, to name a few. And and then I have uh, Mike Shime on drums, who's played with Tommy Swick and the Practically Hip, uh, the the tribute act that's really well known, and and uh, they're just as stellar as could be. So uh, I'm glad everybody was available because <laughs> because mm-hmm. uh, a lot of times they're they're busy. So I I, I lucked out at uh, everybody's availability, but we're gonna be putting on a, a fun a fun rock show. Uh, so just uh, gonna throw on a little bash and play a few of your favorite Christmas songs as well too and and have some fun with it. So again, that's December 9th in Hamilton. That's awesome. You do a lot a lot of good stuff in Hamilton, which is why the uh, the community there lo- loves you. Uh, I like to ask musicians if if they ever ran into resistance. So being a musician <laughs> isn't, you know, you're laughing. So yes, uh, <laughs> you know, being a musician is is not kind of a a standard job to get you know people think that that is a pipe dream you know one in a million make it why are you even that's a hobby you know you need to have an actual regular job did you did you run into that resistance at all from friends or family and if so how did you overcome that and still go on to pursue a career in music uh yeah i mean there's there's always resistance i think in in any a big pursuit that you're trying to to make there's and uh, there was a moment for me where like my parents my father in particular looked at me and says oh you really want to do this right and i remember i uh i was maybe 20 21 or something and i wanted i wanted vocal lessons right and uh but for these vocal lessons they were like seven eight hundred dollars which was like a lot of money for me at the time and i was like and I remember telling him, I, I want to get, I, I'm taking this serious. Like I, I, w- I want to go for these, these sessions. I remember him taking me aside and saying like, Oh, you, you really want to do this. Hey, cause before you would get hey, make sure you got a plan B like, this is fun. Like you said, it's a hobby. Like it's nice, but you know, it, I don't think it can be your life. And when he saw that, like, I was really that serious. He's like, okay, well, if you're going to do it, then you better put your all into this. Right. And, and, uh, it was shortly, it was maybe a year and a half after, so maybe I was a little bit older, year and a half after or so was when the whole idol thing happened, but I was really, really serious. There's a, there's a book that I still need to read, but I've heard on like the Rogan podcast and stuff called uh, The War of Art. Have yeah. you, have you, have you read Pressfield. that? Stephen Pressfield, yeah. Yeah. Have you read it? Yes, twice. Okay. Okay. It's, I mean, it's every creative person needs to read that. And he has, he has another book called um, turning pro and they're both on the same subject of, of yeah. cultivating your, your creative talents. And dude, you have to, like, you should read that tomorrow. It's, yeah. it's life changing. Okay. I will. I will. Cause it's, it's been on the back of my mind and you know, I've, I've actually recently seen a couple of clips online of him talking about it. And uh, the one thing that I love that he mentions when he's saying like the bigger, the dream, the bigger, the shadow. Have you ever heard him say that? I don't know if it was written. I saw him saying on a pod. I'm not sure if it was written in the book, but 
and then he shows this demonstration of you know if i put this big you know this big uh bottle of water or whatever here and you see the shadow well for how big that dream is is how big the shadow is going to be as well too and the shadow is that resistance right and uh and i think uh i think there's there's always going to be uh resistance when you're going through a pursuit i think it's just the meaning that you give it you know um is, is huge so you could either say why is this happening to me and and get really pessimistic about the whole journey and experience and that will flood into the art that you make and the creativity uh can falter because of it for me um you know i remember when i came back home this was kind of the last like resistance for me was when i came back home from nashville and i've mentioned this in my pod a couple times but um I, I I remember I had to I had to make some money too because like I was down I was working trying to make things happen in Nashville but the visa that we had the only way that you could earn money was through music I couldn't go and get a normal job in the states right so we were investing so much money and so much time into our careers but there wasn't really a lot of money coming in right so at that time and we had investors that invested in the band and you know we had to pay this person back and that person back and it was a you know we were kind of betting the farm on on this chance that we were taking and uh and then when when things didn't work out and i decided to come back home i remember i had to kind of go back to just doing gigs again and going to the bars and you know paying the bills and and i remember my ego was getting in the way a little bit and i was talking to my brother i was like yeah what you know are people gonna think like i'm taking a step back or you know do are people gonna think and and it's and honestly short answer all of that is bullshit all of it is bullshit right but i was getting in my own way and my brother said something very simple to me but it really resonated at the time and he goes he goes he goes brian he goes this is what you do that's it he goes this is what you do you're a musician you're a performer get out there and perform whoever's willing to listen. Right. And I said, fuck me. You're right. You're right. Like what the, why, why am I getting in my head about this? And, uh, and then I had a whole different perspective about that. Right. Is I, I do music for a living. Some who know some days, you know, you could be performing in front of thousands of people. Some days you might perform in front of 20 people. It, it, it depends. Right. That's just the ep- ebbs and flows of of this industry but if you love music and you love to create and you love to perform it's already hard enough don't give yourself more resistance to get out there and perform for people and i can't tell you how many times when i've just trusted myself and i've i've gone with the flow then beautiful things happen you know and and Maybe you're doing a gig that isn't paying much. Maybe you'll do a gig for free for some people. But uh, but then all of a sudden through that process, other gigs get presented to you and other opportunities get presented to you. And I think if you're good enough and you work hard enough, that's all that matters, right? So there's always going to be resistance when it comes to your dreams. That's just a part of the process. But, you know, diamonds only get made through pressure, man. So you you have to you have to go through that process. Yeah, you're you're a musician. I mean, if if you wouldn't be happy or fulfilled doing anything else, you oh, know. So you have yeah. to you have to embrace that that's who you are. And uh, Stephen Pressfield, when he talks about resistance, he talks about it like it's an actual entity, like it's it's something that is trying to sabotage you, that is trying mm-hmm. to make things. It's it's like an actual something, not just like he's coining a term. It's it's you know maybe it's it's a survival thing where this, this entity. So I don't know if it's like your ego or your consciousness or something that its main goal is for you to, to, to be alive. And if you're a musician, it's like, that's risky. you like, you know, so it's like all this stuff inside of you that thinks, you know what, you should get a safe, easy job close to home, like beware with transportation. Like maybe it's best if you actually never get out of bed because then you can't, you know, there can't be any accidents. And and that's all resistance is this. Um, it's like your DNA going back through all of human history that has allow, allowed you to make it all the way to where you are today. It's like, you're not just fighting your negative thoughts. You're fighting like 
all of human history's DNA to, to survive. So shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah. One other, one other thing. So he talks about resistance. So yeah. Um, he kind of popularized that that term as far as a creative like you're dealing with resistance but he 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 also talks about something called shadow careers and what that is is someone that that has too much fear to do what they actually should be doing they pursue a shadow career so what that and this is like so painful to think about uh so for example let's say for me, my actual dream is to be a full-time musician, to write, release music, to tour, just do music. And instead I'm doing a podcast where I'm interviewing successful musicians that I have found out of fear for doing it myself, not thinking I'm good enough or not having enough talent or whatever, that my shadow career is doing a podcast and interviewing musicians. So I'm very close to what I actually want to do. Mm -hmm. But if I fail at podcasting, it's okay because that's not my actual dream. Uh, I see. So that's an example uh, of, of shadow careers. Or if someone wants to be an actor and they end up being like the, the, the boom mic guy on set, it's like, he's close to the dream, but he can't step into it. But if he fails as a boom guy, he hasn't failed as an actor, so it's not it's not so bad. So hopefully that example makes sense. It's it's yeah. super powerful, man. You got to check out that book. Yeah, I'm going to. I'm going to. Yeah, I, and I, I think a lot of people can resonate with that too, right? Um, and I feel, you know, a lot of people talk about fear of failure. I also think that a lot of people are afraid of success. You know, if fear of success is just as potent as fear of failure because it's like, well, what if I get everything that I wanted and and I'm still not happy? Or I can't, I can't handle the pressure or I, I get all this and then I, I have it crumble. Like the fall is going to be even harder. Right. So playing it safe. I, I remember uh, um, Jim Carrey saying something about his father being uh, an accountant. And he's like, my dad had this safe job uh, that was secure and, you know, the family's all set. And then one day that safe job fired him and we were basically homeless. So you might as well do what you want because you can fail at what you don't want. And that resonated with me as well, too, because it's like, well, shit, man, I'd rather bet on myself. I've always been that. I've always wanted to bet on myself. And I'm OK with failure. Like I'll, I'll, I've, I've failed a million times. I'll, I'll get up. I'll dust myself off. I'll learn from it. Or sh- I'll sharpen the, the saw and I'll, and I'll go. Um, I, I, I like that better than someone having control over my fate like I I. I, I want I want to figure out a way to to make this work and and uh, sometimes the goal doesn't have to change either. It's just the ways to the goal may may change several times, right? But you, just keeping your eye on that prize and and that consistency is is huge. That's what I find too with some of the young artists that I work with, like when our my my one on one sessions and my mentorship uh, classes and stuff too is 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 just the consistency of what it takes to to do this for a living is you have to put in the work no one's going to care more about this than you right so someone like you even with the podcasting where it's like getting these guests and being consistent you know I, you and i are in the same world when we do this stuff and it's like no one's gonna no one's gonna do the research for you <laughs> no one's gonna book the guests for you you got to do it for yourself and it's the same thing in music right so so just staying consistent and not getting discouraged if you don't see that thing happening right away, right? And and you, you can learn a lot from nature as well, too. Like if I plant tomatoes, uh, you know, in right today and then two weeks from now, I try to pull on that that thing, like you're not going to have tomatoes. There's going to be there's going to be a, a process in play. So you have to have a little bit of faith and trust that things will work out, but it might just be on its own timeline. Yeah, I've, I've met people in the business world that, have have a fear of success as well not even a f- yeah. fear of failure like you mentioned and and their examples was if if they were successful and they had money that everyone would come after their money like they'd rather just not have money to not have people come after them than this hypothetical scenario that once they have money they know that their parents are going to ask for money their sister and that's going to tear apart 
the decent relationship they have now with their family. So there's actually this fear of success. And, um, you know, you hear people like, oh, I, you know, what's the point of making more money? I'll just get taxed more. There's all these, these, these crazy things, but, uh, anyways, yeah. Yeah. And it's all, it's, it's all fear-based. It really is. You know, even if those things were happen, like we'll deal with them when they, when they happen. Right. I, I think, uh, we don't give ourselves enough credit. Like there's been so many times where like somebody said this and I can relate to it. It's like whenever something big has happened, uh, in my life, it was always when I, th- I was so close to being ready, but didn't know I was ready. And then all of a sudden it happens and it's at that little extra growth spurt. Right. Uh, but a lot of people are so fearful of, of ever diving in to, to learn that for themselves that they'd rather go with the motions. You, you see that in relationships. You see there's a lot of people that will stay with familiar, even if they're not happy, have it be a relationship or a job or a career. They will. I will stay with familiar because at least I know this. I'm, I'm not happy with it, but at least I know it than getting uncomfortable and trying something new. Absolutely. Let's, uh, let, let's dive into the, uh, the new music. So you, you, you talked a little bit about it at the start that there's, uh, four new songs. You're aiming to have a single in February. It's got kind of a, a Tom Petty, Bob Seger, Southern rock type of vibe. Um, can, can you talk about the, the writing and recording process? So I assume there, there are some challenges during the pandemic, but you mentioned that you had already been using zoom before, um, yeah, maybe talk our listeners through uh, the listeners that maybe aren't musicians, aren't familiar with what it's like to to write and record an album. If you can kind of dive into what it's been like for those four songs for you. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it all starts with the songs first. So um, when, when I moved back home, like I said, I started to, to write with my my writing partner, Paul Stevens and. Uh, and for me, music, my music uh, ideas, like the the progression and the melodies kind of happen at the same time. A lot of times where I'll be I'll be playing around with with a riff for a melody and 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 I, I like my, my melodies will kind of have shapes. So I'll sort of mumble mumble words or, or sounds that I, I know where where and how I want it to sound like. Uh, I just don't know exactly what it is I'm saying, right? And I'll get to that point. And then usually when I have a concept or a title of what I want to actually sing about, I'll reach out to uh, to Paul. Him and I will get together. And at that point, I probably already have uh, a structure of the song and the hooks of where I want to go. Might even have a title and a concept. And then Paul and I will, a lot of times the songwriting is like what you and I are doing is through the talking process. So if I'm telling you, you know, let, let's say, um, you know, the one song I wrote for, for my wife for the wedding. I mean, you know, that the subject is that that's a love song and it's a, you know, but I'd, I'd hope it's a love song. Yeah. Uh, of course. Right. Yeah, <laughs> of course. It, it, and so that's that's a love song. But but there's so many different angles on how you can approach a love song and how how can I resonate it with with my own story? Right. So that song is called Something About Her. And I remember when him and I were just having conversations and we were talking I remember when she walked into the room before her and I had a conversation, I said to my friends like several times, man, there's something about her, man, there's something about her. There's something about her. And, uh, and that, that, that moment in time is what f- created the framework for that song. Right. So it is called something about her, but I can resonate to, with that. So then I'm in a writing session with Paul. We finally write the lyrics and everything that comes together. And, uh, actually I wrote that with Andrew McTaggart and Susie McNeil as well. So it was the four of us on that one. And then I have these songs and then at, at a certain point I had, you know, dozens and dozens of songs. I probably wrote like a hundred plus songs in like two years. So then it's the songs that are resonating for me. So, um, and then as far as how you record the record, a lot of, you, you can approach it a lot of different way, ways, depending on what your style is and what you want to do. For me, um, I, I got into the studio and I, I co-produced it with my friend Carm Milioto in Hamilton uh, at their studio called Studio 410. And uh, they got a really great space, great live room. They have a, a Neve console, uh, really, really great. So um, so then it was just getting the, 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 
players involved and and sometimes we'll do some pre-production so pre-production is see for me a lot of times you can actually like demo up songs so you have uh, ian thornley who demo up demos up the song and he has all these parts set and, and ready to go. Mine was a little bit different where I had work tapes. I didn't want to get too influenced from, from uh, me creating a demo. So I had work tapes just really rock and the song stand on its own as just like a, an acoustic uh, singer songwriter tune. And now how will that feel with the band? And then, then it's giving the songs to the guys, giving them a feel and references as far as what I'm, I'm going for. And then we find something, we find a wave, and we try to write it, right? So at that at that point, once we have the songs down, the main thing is making sure you get the drums and that the drum song, the drum sounds are great. And then you get uh, the rhythm section, so the bass. Um, once those are done, then we'll have we may have some rough guitar helping them in the room at that at that moment. That's how we approached it. But then the next day we went in with uh, with Andrew McTaggart and he laid down all all the guitar parts for that. I laid down my vocals, and and then we then my harmonies and then keys and uh, one one song my friend who's an incredible uh, violinist she uh, she there's a whole like string quartet on this like this one tune that I have called In the Air, uh, and she's still in Nashville so she actually sent those tracks to us here. So thank God for technology these days. So uh, and then you get the song to a great place. And now where I've been with those songs, I've gone to the mixing process. So now I have a mixing engineer and basically a mixing engineer. Their job is to make you sound really, really great. So you have all these raw files of all these songs, all these um, uh, tracks that you've recorded from bass to vocals to guitar. And now it's, it's trying to make it sound like a million bucks. And that's where we're at right now. And uh, and then you will master that process. So mastering is kind of like the way I compare it to is like if I were to wash my car and it's really clean, uh, mastering is like the coat of wax that really gives it that extra like shine. Right. So so uh, so it, it is a bit of a process, you know, to really try to make it sound great. And there's there's a lot of different ways to do it. There's there's people that are just track guys that there's no other musician there. They may they may just have uh, a track guy that's that's sitting there on a computer and he's coming up with bass parts on his keyboard and and program drums and, and it you know you hear you hear it a lot in like a lot of the LA sounds so it 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 all depends on your approach but that was my specific approach and do you have a, a favorite part of the recording process some musicians like the writing of the songs some like the fleshing out of the songs with other musicians some like being in the studio, uh, it, whether it's, you know, jamming with musicians in the studio, some like recording the vocals, some love just doing the harmonies, some like being in there for the mixing. Is there one part that you love more than the rest? Some people, not only that they love one part more than others, some people dread certain parts. Like they love writing the songs, but they hate doing their own vocals in the studio, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say there's a one A one B for me, so obviously songwriting. So when when you get a song that you know you you feel you nailed and and you you get really excited about, that never gets old for me ever, because it's like I wake up that morning I'm like this song did not exist when I woke up this morning, and now I have this living breathing thing that I can call my own right. So that process I love. Um, the next process is when I'm with the musicians and I'm watching, I'm watching the song evolve in front of my eyes. So if I'm sitting down, you know, and all of a sudden I, I actually finally hear a rhythm section to my song and I'm like, oh my God, it's breathing all this cool life into it. And then, uh, my, you know, Andrew comes in with a guitar lick that just adds another beautiful hook or, or vibe to it that I didn't think, you know, it, it would go to. Um, that excites the hell out of me of where these songs go, right? So those are my my two favorite. I'll say I'll, I mean, singing in the studio is is fun, but but yeah, you're your worst critic. So you can like I I'm infamous for like wanting to take another t like. There's some producers that just say just give me two three takes. That's it. Like if it was up to me, I'd be singing twenty thirty takes as much as I can because I just want to have as much out there as possible and make sure that I, I do my best. And it's usually overkill, but 
just for my sanity, I have to get it out there. There's a, there's nowhere to hide as a singer in the studio. You know, <laughs> no. it's not like you're in the, the bathroom and you're just drowning in reverb and everything sounds amazing. <laughs> when you're just up close with a mic, it's like, yeah, you're, you're hearing exactly what your voice sounds like. So singers, when they hear themselves recorded for the first time, they're like, yeah, that's what I sound like. We actually hear ourselves different than we sound like, because we're hearing kind of from the inside. We hear like, yeah, the, we hear the voice kind of bouncing off our skulls there's different things uh so when you hear yourself the first time you're like that's that's what i sound like it sounds a little more nasally than than i hear myself yeah you know? i i find too like one thing where i i feel like oh, okay i gotta tighten up on that in the studio is is locking in rhythmically vocally is is really key so when you're on tempo and it's this groove as far as pocket because you you know if you're a good singer, you know, you sing the notes, it's, it's good, but how pocketed can you be, uh, with the music and, and you may be just a hair off or before or after, and it doesn't give the right vibe, right? I have one song that is, that's going to be released called, uh, chasing arrows and the chorus, it, it has to be on the right tempo. And if I'm singing too fast or too slow, it does not feel right. So it has to feel pocketed. Right. And if, you don't have enough like air in your diaphragm or, you know, certain things like that, where you feel like you're, you're, uh, you know, losing a bit of breath that, that can be a challenge sometimes, but, uh, but that, that really, the whole studio process and recording process, uh, that really helped me pocket my vocal much better with, with bands. So when I actually go and play live that I'm, I'm locked in more. Speaking of recording vocals, do you have a favorite vocal mic in the studio? And then maybe live, is there a certain mic that you normally use that sounds great on your voice? Everyone has a different voice. So I've, I have a high yeah. nasally voice that sounds nothing like how I speak. And there's a certain mic that kind of shaves off the high mosquito piercing frequencies yeah. and kind of, you know, rounds out with the low end of the voice. Yeah. You know, funny enough, the first few albums the first couple albums that i did um for some reason each producer would always like the sm7 the simple sm7 five hundred dollar mic always liked my voice so they had i'd be in these studios and they have like these five thousand dollar mics and i'm singing the five hundred dollar sm7 mic and it, and for whatever reason it, it matches well with my voice but i would say those my first two albums that's what i sang um this one, oh man, Carm, you're gonna kill me, buddy, if I get this wrong. What the hell was it? It was a Telefunken. I think we sang from a Telefunken. I forget exactly what model of mic I was singing from, but but that was a great mic as well too. But yeah, for the most part, a big chunk of it was just the simple SM7. That's awesome. That's awesome. And and you're you're working with Mark Capaferi as a an engineer or a producer or mixer or something? Yeah, yeah, mixing engineer. Yeah. Mixing yeah, I engineer. Just, I was just messaging him about it right before I hopped on the podcast with you. Awesome. So I know Mark from my time at uh, Metalworks. So he was also oh, at okay. Metalworks. Yeah. And uh I have some kind words sent in from Mark Capaferi. Here we oh, go. Oh, did you so reach out to Mark? <laughs> I did. Yeah, I did my homework. So he says, uh, I really dig working with Brian. He's a great singer songwriter, and he has a ton of passion that comes through in his performance. There's just something about his voice and he takes his craft so seriously that it makes my job easy. He gives a hundred percent every time as a person. Well, he's a great guy, good hearted, and we share the same family values. It must be the European thing. LOL. What can I say? I love the dude. We've uh, become good pals. So that's Mark Capaferi. Uh, Mark, I love you, buddy. Yeah, good, yeah, that makes sense now because he said good luck on the pod today. So <laughs> he's, he's in the loop. Like, he's in the loop. Well, first, uh, kudos to you for for uh, taking so much care in the pod with your guests. I know you do this a lot with your other guests, and um, uh, that, that says a lot about you. So, so thanks for uh, going out of your way to make your guests feel good about themselves. You know, especially on a Monday. You know, <laughs> so yeah, like uh, gloomy Mondays. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can only echo what he said about me and throw it back to Mark. You know, Mark, uh, uh, we got introduced from uh, from my co-producer uh, Carmilioto uh, a couple years ago. We knew of each other, but didn't really spend that much time together. And uh, and the one thing I can say about Mark is like 
he has treated my songs like his own. And like going back to the whole uh, analog and going through tape and stuff, like he's the one that's saying, he goes, Brad, you're going to kill me. I know you wanted these songs done, but because he's out in Jukasa and what he did was he's teaching there and a couple of the guys there, he's like, okay, I'm going to put, and he used my song as an example. He's like, okay, I'm going to put the bass and the, the bass drum and the snare. I'm going to put a couple of these through tape just to show you guys the difference. And he heard it and he's like, oh my God, this sounds really good. And he goes, he called me, he's like, Bri, you're going to kill me, but what do you think about, you know, putting all the tracks through tape and then we'll go and, and, and mix it. And then we'll, and then we'll put it through tape again. Right. And for the listeners, tape is basically all those great albums that we were talking about all went through tape, you know, and, uh, tape really gives that lush, smooth sound. There's a warmth. There is a beautiful warmth. Right. So, uh, and especially like the, the style of music, that acoustic rock that I'm doing, uh, and it being more organic is kind of asking for it. So, um, so, but he wants to take the time and the effort to get all that done. So, so, uh, so he's been doing that and it's been really, uh, helping the song sound that much better. And, uh, and I'm, I'm super excited for them to be, uh, completed, which, you know, hopefully in the next few weeks they, they will be, but, but it, having someone like that in my corner, along with his, his brother, Rob, uh, the two of them have just been, uh, like they've treated the songs like their own. And that's, that's all you can ask for it. He could have easily just like mixed these things in two, three days and then be done with it. But, uh, but that's just not his style. He, he holds a high standard and, uh, and it's been, it's been fun to work with him. So, so I love his passion as well. For our young listeners that are musicians who are considering maybe having a career in music, what advice do you, do you give them for them to start off on, on the right foot? Um, I would say this, like, obviously you have to start, with a dream and, and a passion for music. And if it's pulling you in, um, that, that's, that's a great place to start, you know, knowing that it's pulling you in. If you're, if you're going to bed and you're thinking about music, if you're waking up in the morning and you're thinking about music, then you should probably pursue this in, in some facet. Um, one quote that always resonates with me though, is how you do anything is how you do everything. Right. And, what I mean by that is if you're going to half-ass music in this area, what else are you half-assing? So it's really, you, you want to build the character, no matter what it is, you want to build the character and the work habits to get things done. You can have a lot of dreams. You can have a lot of ideas, but if you're not putting in the time to be the best guitarist, uh, then it, it's probably not going to happen in a lot of cases because your uh, the, the passion and the drive and that character uh, it, it isn't at that level. So uh, also just know that these, these things don't happen overnight. So control what you can control, no matter what that is. If you want to be a really great songwriter, hang out with other songwriters. Write as much as you can. You want to be a great drummer, uh, do everything you can to learn that extra 5 or 10% to be that much better. Learn how to sing so that you can sing harmony, so you have more tools in your toolbox so that you can do this as a career, right? So I think let let that passion drive you and, and, and lead you into the direction of that music, but also just remind yourself that it's going to take a lot of hard work and a lot of good habits to, uh, to get you over that hump. So if you have that passion and that good work ethic together, then good things will happen. When I was 13, my last semester, um, before going to high school, I did a co-op in a recording studio and the studio manager there gave me the best advice ever. Uh, he, he said, Joel, you're serious about being a musician, right? I said, yes. Uh, he said, okay, well, how, how much time do you spend playing guitar a day and you know i'm i'm proud i'm thinking you know uh, an hour or two a day and i'm thinking that's pretty good he goes okay let me get this straight in any other career any other field they're working at least eight hours a day so you think that because you're a musician you're special you think that just one or two hours a day in your profession is enough no, you need to you need to put in at least the eight hours that everyone's doing as a mechanic as a engineer as whatever and that's where my work ethic comes from since 
13 was from that one guy. And since then it was, okay, well, I need eight hours a day doing music. So if it's two hours practicing guitar, one hour learning a new cover, uh, one hour booking shows, one hour updating the website, it was an hour as a musician, as a professional, uh, it was, it was eight hours doing that. So that was, that was probably the best advice I've received for, uh, getting yeah. started. Yeah. Well, and, you know, working, working with, uh, I've said this to a lot of my students too, that I'm working with. Some of them are, are these aspiring artists and they're very talented and they have great music and I'll help them along as far as things that they need to do to get going and get that, that ball moving. Uh, but I remind them, you know, they may come back to the session like a week later and not much has been done. Like, okay. Well, what do I do now? It's like, well, okay. Like you just have to work anything that you can do, do it. And, and, and you, you have to have that want to get out there. I'll, I'll give another piece of advice too, depending on the person's personality, right? Sometimes the only way to get yourself through, to get that goal in. And I found that that helped me too, is, is setting deadlines and goals that you can't uh, turn your back on. Right. So for example, I had one student, who she's been wanting to get a repertoire of music so she can actually get out there and start doing the cover circuit and obviously playing her own music, right? But she has to learn all these songs. She had she wasn't disciplining herself to actually learn all this music that she needs to learn to actually get these gigs, right? So she got an opportunity and she booked a gig without knowing these songs yet. She booked a gig and she had about less, I think maybe a week or week and a half to learn like 15, 16 songs. Well, guess what? She learned why because she burned the boats. There, there's it's a necessity now. If I don't, if I don't learn these musics, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be embarrassed. I'm going like I, and sometimes, sometimes it's, it's the fear of, of what would happen if you don't follow through that, that, uh, that makes you follow through to get things done compared to, uh, you know, just kind of going through the motions. So, because she set that deadline and she even spoke it out to, and made some posts saying, I'm going to be here. Well, if we're all going to be there. You know, last thing she wants to do is embarrass herself. So she worked her ass off and all of a sudden she's working eight, nine, 10 hours, like you were saying, to make sure that she got all this music done. And she did. Right. So if anybody's trying to is in that kind of funk, I would suggest that to them as well, too, is like put yourself out there burn the boats and i promise you just from not wanting to be embarrassed you're gonna you're gonna try to try to get through that finish line i i heard an elon musk quote so uh so, you know we talked about kanye he was not popular and elon who's not popular these, these are the two least popular guys right now uh for for doing some controversial things but anyways i heard an elon quote that was it was something like take your 10-year goals and try to do them in 10 months. It was some like ridiculous yeah. time span and it seems impossible. But if you start to say, okay, these 10 year goals, what would I have to do? Even though it's pretty much impossible, what would I have to do to do it in 10 months? And suddenly you yeah. just start thinking differently and maybe you end up achieving those goals in two years and not in the 10 months, but you're still yeah. eight years ahead of the other game plan. So I thought that was helpful as well. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it makes you think of that problem, if you want to call it a problem, or that challenge in a in a different light, that framework, uh, as far as how you're you're approaching it. You know, a little bit of working smarter, not harder, as well, right? You you've had a, a lengthy career in the music industry. How do you keep this fun after all these years? So I know you're having a blast with the recording, the writing, playing shows, different events. Uh, how how do you keep this fun? How are you not burnt out? How are you not jaded? How are you still a nice guy? who is super uh, having fun and, and uh, still super inspired and motivated. You know what, Joel, honestly, bro, um, I'm having more fun now at 40 than I was when I was 25. Like I think as I get older, I have a deeper appreciation that I'm still able to do this and just how lucky I am. So I think it's, it's gratitude just being so thankful that I, I get to do this for a living. I've been able to, to maintain this um, as a living for 15 years and, uh, and, and trying to, you know, I, I, you have bad days, but even the bad days aren't that bad. You know, when, when you put everything into perspective, 
as far as how bad it can be. Right. So I just feel so lucky that, um, that I, you know, I have some talent in, in music and that I'm able to express myself. And then, you know, with what I'm doing here at, uh, at the music school in Hamilton, uh, studio E and, and passing the baton as well to, to some of these young artists that I see myself in. Um, I, I, I mean that, that, that adds more energy to, uh, to it as well too. And I think, you know, as you keep on for me as a songwriter, as I keep on writing songs and people, and and now that I'm getting to that next phase where I'm going to be releasing music, it always feels new again when you get to that phase. Right. And um, I'm just addicted to love and connection, man. Like, like I, I just getting up on stage and connecting with people through music and making them feel something is the greatest gift to me. So, so that, that makes me feel great. And, you know, sometimes you might feel burnt out, but after, you know, I'll, I'll give myself a day or a day and a half when I feel like that. And, uh, and then, and then I'll just get back at it, man. But, but I'm, I'm too blessed and too lucky to, to complain about it or get jaded. I, I love it. I have two fan questions sent in here. I don't want to forget them because these fans made the effort of sending these in. So okay. the first question is from Brian Mello, super fan, Amanda Luciano, whom we both know, okay. uh, she wants to know, what do you believe is your greatest accomplishment since idol so whatever for you you're most proud of uh getting married to my wife this that is this definitely the summer. correct answer yeah <laughs> happy uh, wife happy life yeah yeah uh, honestly though man she's my best friend she's my best friend and uh, i feel so lucky to have her in my life um and uh you know we had some delays with covid but uh being able to to marry my best friend um i'm i I feel very very lucky and uh yeah this past summer this year has been uh, has been a special one for me so a a lot of a lot of really good things have have happened and and uh but nothing trumps that that again that is the that is the right answer in case yeah, the wife I, yeah, listens I, yeah. to this episode. Well done, yeah, sir. I, I st- I thank you. I still get to go home. No, no, there I'm you joking. go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, this next question, you might also know this person. This is from Jordan Diaz. Uh, okay. And he, he asks, what level of work did it take to get to where you are? So I don't know if you, you can actually somehow put into words the level of work you put in. I work uh, real hard. <laughs> yeah. Uh, level of work. Um I mean, I, it's, it's been, uh, how, I don't know how to explain or how to show like the measurement of work I've done. So, but, uh, all I can say is, you know, whatever it is that you're doing, you know, you gotta grab your lunchbox clock in there <laughs> and, and do it. And I, I think work has never really, uh, phased me, you know, when it comes to that, I don't, I don't mind, uh, working hard. Um, it's just, you know, remembering your purpose of, of why you're doing it. Um, but with that said, I am always constantly trying to sharpen the saw and get better, um, through my vocals, through my musicianship, through songwriting, through, uh, marketing, through podcasting, through speaking, through teaching, through mentoring, through, you know, trying to be an entrepreneur. Um, so I, I think it's just, uh, it's a constant, fight with that resistance that you talk about so um you have you have to work through it but um as cliche as it sounds when you're doing what you love a lot of the times it doesn't feel like work right so that's not every day for me but a big chunk of it is and i feel fortunate so i think uh i think attitude is everything right so um you just, you just got to keep on working, but if you love it and you, and you know that it's the actual journey that you're on, that, that, that is everything that, you know, that, that will make uh, that workload feel a lot lighter. Right. And I think that, that was, that was a big thing for me too. I think when I'm younger, I'm always trying to get myself, when I was younger, I was trying to get myself to a destination, you know, and then once I get here, I'll be happy. And once I get there, I'll be happy. And, I just realized it really is the pursuit that you're in right now, what we're doing right now, you know, um, like what you, you and I say, talk about like podcasting. If you and I were to talk and, 
you know, we, we could chat, chat about our first time you and I decided to do our first episode and how that felt like and, and the buildup of actually doing it. Right. And you're in, you know, almost 80 episodes in, but those little milestone moments are the ones that you really resonate on. And, and that's just you being through the journey. So, um, I, yeah, it, it's a tough question to, to answer, but I think more than anything, whatever it is, just do it with love. Let's, uh, let's stick with podcasting while we're on that. Let's talk about the beyond the melody podcast. Um, yeah. for our listeners, uh, if you guys enjoy this podcast, I'm sure you'd love Brian's podcast. Uh, the, both are, are unique in their own way, but what we do have similar is we're, we're doing deep dive interviews with really remarkable people. And yeah. uh, because of our backgrounds in the entertainment industry, there is a lot of musicians, a lot of bands, but there are also other amazing people. There's authors, there's yeah, Doug Gilmore from the Toronto Maple Leafs. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Um, so I guess my, my question is what has been kind of the biggest challenge uh, that you've faced so far with your podcast? Has it been figuring out the technical stuff in the equipment? Has it been, is it hard to secure good guests? Is it hard to keep an interview interesting for an hour or two? What, what have you found to be the most challenging? Maybe it's the amount of preparation needed for each guest. Anything come to mind? Yeah, I think, uh, the consistency making sure that the consistency is there and and you know that there is an episode ready that is of quality every wednesday uh when, when i release my podcast and i felt that when i was getting married in june all of a sudden my life was getting really really busy and i felt like i was rushing to get episodes done and to get it out there and i felt like the you know i i didn't wasn't able to get uh, enough research in like I like because I'm like you I want to I want to get a deep dive in as much as I possibly can and, and get to know the guests uh, so I had to uh, not that I had to but I decided to uh, take a break for about three or four months on the podcast during the summer and that was tough for me because you know you build momentum and you're going but but uh, but for me I just I needed to do it because there was so much going on and I'm glad I did because now I can come back refreshed and, you know, I'm actually more excited than ever to, you know, keep these podcasts and these episodes going. Uh, but I also know, okay, like, like, I don't know what you, but I, I, I need to bank my episodes. Like uh, just because I have a couple other things going on, if I don't, it can creep up on me quickly. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm like, Oh my God, I gotta, you know, get an episode. And, and, and as far as the guests go, um, some guests are hard to get and I, I still got my wish list and I'm, I know, and there's some people that I, I want to reach out to, but for the most part, I've been really, uh, organic with it where there's a lot of, a lot of the guests that I have on the podcast may suggest other people that they know already. And then that leads into another guest and that leads into another person. And that's been a lot of the, the guests that have popped on the podcast. So that has been, that's been the biggest challenge with consistency. Um, as far as the tech side, I know I'm not tech savvy. I knew that off the hop. So uh, I actually have like a producer editor that I send my my episodes to. So I don't have to worry about it. Oh, so, you fancy, huh? Yeah, I'm a little fancy. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I trying to trying to build the, the school here and, and doing the music and then doing my gigs. And uh, uh, it was just a lot of a lot of time. So. For me, I was like, you know, I'd rather just create the content and then I send it, I send it to, uh, uh, my new, I got a new producer by the name of, uh, Jeremy Miller and, uh, he, uh, he takes, he takes care of the content and, uh, and then he sends it to me. I, I give it a listen and then put it there. But I, 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 I wanted to make it as foolproof and as easy as possible so that I could keep that consistency. Where I, if I got too like bogged down from everything else that's happening, I, I wouldn't want to get back into another position where, you know, I'm having to stop the podcast just to bank episodes so that I I, I keep them consistent. Yeah, you're talking about referrals in the business world. It's it's you always have to ask for a referral. Like the money is in the referrals, and uh, yeah, same. I I've, I've been able to take that from the business world over to the podcast. As soon as I'm done an episode, I ask the guest, hey 
can you think of anyone that would be an amazing interview for the podcast? And they always give one to three people. And, you know, having Gordy Johnson of Big Sugar, that was from um, Clayton Bellamy of the Road Hammers. He he uh, said, oh, how about Gordy Johnson? I'm like, uh, <laughs> yeah, that would be yeah. like the most famous and, you know, iconic guitarist that I've, I've, I've had. And then, <laughs> you know, R- Rich Beto from Finger Eleven, he's like, yeah. how about Seku uh, from, from Big Rack? And uh, through Rich, I have the drummer from Papa Roach coming on, which is like ridiculous. And yeah. yeah, so it's, it's all about the referrals. And, you know, if you do a great job with your interview and they see that yeah. you put your heart into it and the research and all that stuff, it's almost like they want to, they want to, give back and the way they can give back is just suggesting someone they're, they're friends with, you know? So, uh, yeah, so I, the, I, the referrals are a big one. Yeah. I do the same thing too. I'll never ask until after the episode's done. I'm like, well, let them, let them see if they enjoyed the actual experience first before I start asking for referrals. So when, once they get a vibe of what it is and then it's really, you know, mine, mine is, uh, mine's a little different where we, a lot of times we're in the same room together on my pod, but I, uh, uh, I obviously have some questions for them, but I, I, I like, I like it to kind of just fall into just us, you know, shooting the shit and just kind of, you know, kicking back and, and, and talking. But, but, uh, once they kind of get a vibe of how relaxed and chill it is, then they, uh, uh, they, they usually give some referrals as well, which has been awesome. What, what's, what, how about for you? Cause now I'll tell you mine, but, uh, what do you think has been the best part of podcasting for you so far? I think having deep conversations with people, basically, you know, yeah. I, uh, especially with the pandemic, like I, I, I've been living alone for three years where a lot of the pandemic, it's like, if you leave your house, you're a bad person or you're going to die or whatever. So <laughs> it, for me, it's almost mental health where it's yeah. allowed me at least once or twice a week to have real conversations with real people and I'm, I'm yeah. learning and I'm hearing about their challenges and I'm getting inspired and, and networking at the same time. And the podcast allows me to set goals and I'm building towards something meaningful. So uh, yeah. for me, the podcast, I guess more than anything, it's, it's just, you know, to have human connection, it sounds pretty sad, but, uh, but yeah, no. that's what it's been for me. How about you? Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. Um, the conversations and just the relationships I've been able to build um, through the podcast as well, where it's like, I can call some of these people friends now, you know, and, and we, uh, we started on the pod and, you know, where else can you sit down with somebody for an hour uninterrupted and just have these meaningful conversations, right? It's actually quite hard to do in life, right? There's so many other distractions and, a lot of other things going on where all of a sudden you've actually just scheduled in time just to sit back and chat. Right. So, so because of that, you build a great rapport with a lot of people and, uh, and you build great relationships along the path. So that that's, that's been a beautiful thing for me. When you look back at all the episodes that you've done, all the interviews, yeah. what, what do you think is the best interview you've done and, or who is your favorite guest? So they can be, diff- they can be two different things. Oh boy. Uh, let me think here. Wow. We're on, I'm a little behind you. I got to catch up because of those four months. I think I had the lead on you for, for a, a split second. So now I think you got, you got like 16 or 18 episodes on me. So I think I got to like 60 something now. Uh, so through that, oh man, there's a, there's a lot of good ones. Was there any interview that you finished where you're like, wow, that like, yeah, you, you felt like you were most prepared you were most in the zone you ask great questions you were open and and vulnerable and authentic like if and you know maybe it wasn't the biggest guest or sure whatever yeah. but it's you yourself you're like wow like i i i reach some other level as an interviewer uh, during that one yeah uh i don't know i don't know if i've i'm always trying to get better so i thought you were gonna so, say i'm i'm always yeah, yeah yeah you know uh, every interview is 100%, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i can't single one out yeah. <laughs> no no i'm always trying to get better so so you know when i when i listen back to myself there's like i'm always realizing ah maybe, you know maybe you know i was saying too many yeahs or ums or okay maybe i should let me just clean that up a little bit and um 
so so I'm 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 trying to always resharpen the saw. So um I mean I but there's there's for me it's just the conversations, like the ones that just felt really natural and that we just caught a wave. Uh one that stands out to me and it's my most downloaded episode was uh with a guy by the name of Vaden Earl. And uh if anyone wants to listen to that, it's an incredible story, but, uh, he had a, there was a story that went viral here in Canada about his daughter that he was trying to adopt in the Dominican. She was a, uh, a Haitian girl, but living the Dominican with uh, no papers because of the earthquake that happened in Haiti, uh, years ago. And they're basically like a month away from bringing her home. And then the person that was taking care of their file and everything that uh, with the the adoption uh, died in that building. That building crumbled. All the papers were gone, and she was paperless, paperless basically. And then that led to a twelve year journey of trying to get her to Canada. And the stuff that they had to go through between with how the Canadian government uh, dealt with it to uh, Dominicans trying to get uh, deport Haitians out of their country um, and this poor girl in, in the middle of all of that uh, is crazy is is crazy so his story uh, he's and he's an incredible storyteller as well and and uh, so that one stands out to me as far as like one of the most profound podcasts that I had um, I will say um, Doug Gilmore was was one of my all time favorite athletes growing up. One of the first autographs I ever got was from Doug Gilmore. Um, when I uh, uh, we went to my local mall with like Dave Anderchuk, <laughs> and uh, and I, now I can call him a friend, you know, and which is super cool. So he was awesome. I mean, he invited me into his home. That's where we did the podcast. His wife had a who who was actually friends with my family um uh, had a charcuterie board ready for me <laughs> like they treated Damn. me so well. like just ready to go and you know we're drinking on Arnold palmers and and just you know i get to talk to him about the high stick that wayne gretzky did in the 1993 playoffs and i mean these were monumental like moments in sports for me you know growing up and i'm able to sit down with doug and just uh talk about that and then after that episode when we were done he takes me down and he's showing me some of his memorabilia and somebody gifted him with a cigar box guitar. Right. And it had the guitar case was in the maple leaf blue and, and, uh, and they made the cigar box guitar and he goes, man, he's, it's been sitting on my couch for three years. He goes, I want to give it to somebody that really, really know how to play it. So I was like, I got the guy for you. And it was my guitarist, Andrew McTaggart. I like, I could have taken it for myself. But I just wouldn't have done it justice. I wouldn't. I wouldn't even know how to play it. My man, my uh, my guitarist is a great slide player. So, and he was a big uh, Gilmore fan as well too. So he gifted that to me, and uh, and I and I went and I gifted it to Andrew, and uh, it came with all the paperwork and everything. And then Andrew messages me and he goes, "Bry, he goes, do you realize that inside the cigar box guitar is a Doug Gilmore rookie card signed?" I was like, no, I didn't know that. He goes, well, you're taking the rookie card. He goes, you gave me this. He goes, you're taking the rookie card. I was like, and he wouldn't take no for an answer. So I have the rookie card now, the signed Doug Gilmore rookie card, and uh, and he has he has a cigar box guitar. But that was all thanks to uh, to Doug's uh, generosity. So that moment, that just that day was super cool, and uh, and him and his family have just been so wonderful to me. So. So that stands out as well. But I mean, I can go on and on, man. I honestly can. There's, there's a, a Dave McMillan. He's a great friend of mine. Like I said, from Big Rec, you know, sitting down and talking with him. Some of my, my old friends, um, uh, Tommy Swick, who's a good friend of mine. Uh, that was a really great podcast. George Pimentel, who's a, a, a world renowned photographer, being able to sit down and chat with him. And uh, he's basically taking pictures of every start known to man. Uh, I mean, everyone's so unique in their own way, you know, and it's just, it's fun to pick their brains and get to know them a little bit better. So, so it, it's honestly been a, been a pleasure. When I saw that you had Doug Gilmore on, I was like, oh shit, I need to step up my podcast. <laughs> I was like, I need to get some, 
I need to yeah. raise my 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 ambition for these guests. So yeah, but you know what, man? You know what I'm finding is some of these guests that uh, that might not be as well known. Like I had a, I have an artist that's coming out, and he's an independent artist. Not a lot of people know know him in a in a grander scale. But we had such an open hearted conversation that was very real that it, it was like one of my favorites. But a lot of people don't know who he is, right? So that's another thing too. It's it doesn't always have to be the big name. It's just like just good conversation with good people. I have uh, two more questions about the podcast. Who who would you say your you mentioned before you have a list of dream guests? Who would you say are your top three? Like if if we could wave a magic wand and you could get three guests booked next, uh, three three guests booked to come up in the near future. Who would your three be? Oh, okay. All right, let me think about this. Dave Grohl. Damn. Rick Rubin. Damn. And Joe Rogan. Am I allowed to have the same three that you have? Because those are <laughs> sure. those are good choices. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd say those those three. Those and, I, for some reason that was my knee jerk reaction, but that feels right. I'd say those three. And why? Just quickly for each one of those, why? Uh, I mean, I, I I just like the way they think, and and I, and and uh, I, I just I I like being around uh, creative, ambitious people, right? So. Uh, someone like like Dave Grohl, I mean, he just has this this like dynamic energy. I got to meet him. I got to like shoot the shit with Dave for like five minutes uh, at Sony. Him and Taylor got rest in peace. Uh, and I have that picture in my office too. Just me and Dave. That that was an amazing experience. And his energy, honestly, when that guy walked in, like, there's some people that have like rock star auras he has that it right he just does and uh and i just wish i was able to actually really sit down and talk with him much longer and uh so that that would be great and and i mean just from going to be a a, a drummer of the greatest band ever to being the lead singer of one of the greatest rock bands then to actually being a pretty badass director and, and creating all these awesome documentaries that he's done and uh and just being an awesome guy throughout it all like like i just think i think i'd have a good time with him rick rubin is a new one because i saw rick rubin in in joe rogan's podcast i don't know if you listen to that one or not yep yep and i just love creatively how he how he thinks and how he views the world um and he is he is all about the art right and he's done it on his terms and, and strictly through instinct and it has worked incredibly well. And I think that's a great reminder of just to be instinctful with with uh, what it is that you believe in. Uh, Joe Rogan, man, I mean, who wouldn't want to like, I mean, that guy is is unbelievable. And uh, he knows he knows a ton. He's super knowledgeable, but he has incredible discipline and his work ethic, I think, would be contagious. Just being around a guy like that and seeing, you know, especially being in the podcast world and seeing how big his podcast has gone, it just it, it motivates you to to want to get out there. And especially for guys like us that are in that that realm, it definitely motivates me to to want to do more. You know, it always bugs me when I you see someone that's killing it and you know they're running marathons and they're doing, and then I'll look at them I'm like, well, why not? Like they're not special. They're just working really freaking hard and they're doing all the right things and, and, and the results are amazing. Right. So when I see people doing it, it's like, well, why not, why not me? Like what, what are they doing that I don't know? So I'd like to get to know those guys and maybe steal some of their secrets in the process. Yeah. And for guys like us that have a podcast, Joe Rogan is the pinnacle of what's truly possible in this medium, right? He, he yeah. signs a hundred million dollar deal with Spotify and rumor has it. It's way more than more. That. Like that's just yeah. the that's assumption the is what it yeah. was, but everyone else that knows him is like, yeah, it's like 200 or something yeah. crazy. Um, so yeah, man. And that would, that would be an amazing, uh, that would be an amazing interview and a, an amazing talk with Joe Rogan. And dude, his his podcast apparently gets, uh, I, I think it's 2 billion downloads a year. 
And so he's, wow. he's the biggest media source on the planet, period. Like if, yeah, if yeah. that's why, if, you know, Rick Rubin was on, cause he has a new book coming out and, and, um, I don't know, uh, uh, they just, just came on anyways. Uh, I just watched the uh, newest episode and it's cause they have a documentary that just launched on Friday. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, is it- Randall Carlson and Graham Han Graham Hancock. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I watched that entire eight episode series, like the day after it came out, um, just showing that it I'm works watch- like people go I'm watching on. it right now. Same. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. I'm watching it right now. Yeah. Yeah. So Joe Rogan has become the biggest media empire on the planet. And it's like one guy with a microphone and a camera and, yeah. and he has the biggest reach and people can go on and actually have real discussions instead of, you know, doing know. a 20 minute interview and then they edit it to go with their agenda. They make you look bad. Like they take an answer from a different question and put it to this question. And it's, it's. Yeah. And that's why you see some of these bigger media companies that try to go after him. Cause you get that big. Right. And it's like, he's, he's much bigger than a CNN or a Fox news. Like if, if you actually look at the numbers, right. So, yeah. uh, so, you know, he gets hate, but anybody at that level, Oh, I'll throw, I'll throw another guy in there that I'd love to talk to is uh Chappelle, Dave Chappelle. Yeah. I would love to talk to that guy as well too. He's just interesting. And I'm a big fan of comedy and, uh, I think he's on the Mount Rushmore in my opinion. So, uh, so I'd like to talk to him too. There's so many people, man. You, we could be here for, that's you, a podcast in itself. You could Dave. probably get Joe Rogan and Dave Chappelle together. Right. Let's kill. And then they, how about they do a lot of stuff together. we'll hop yeah. on the Rogan podcast. We'll have the two of them there with us and, and boom, like half our list is already taken care of. There you go. And I'm sure that uh, <laughs> Rick Rubin and Dave Grohl, I'm sure they have a history too. So yeah. Uh, yeah. We can, we can double down if we have to, but uh, anyways, we'll get to a point where you can get them all individually anyways, but that's uh, it. That's it. Um, I was going to say, Oh, uh, Chappelle is playing Toronto. I don't know if you know this. Chappelle, oh, is it? New Year's day. So if you want to start 2023 off on the right foot, he's no gonna, way. Uh, I think Scotiabank arena is the Toronto arena, right? I didn't um, know that. I'm going to have to look that up. Yeah. So there you go. That's your uh, post wedding uh, gift. I don't know to yourself. I don't know. <laughs> there you uh, go. Yeah. So a- anyways, I uh, we we've already gone over two hours. There you go. We didn't know. Oh, amazing. You know, we didn't know because we already did a two hour deep dive of your entire life. But uh, yeah. it's nice when you can just sit down with a friend and just talk and and you know it's not all scripted questions. You just go no. where 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 it takes you. So um, as as we wrap up, I just wanted to. Uh, to take a moment to acknowledge you, man, it, you, you've, you, you've had a lifelong pursuit of mastery as a musician, as a singer songwriter. And, uh, you know, you, you, you really put your heart and soul into your music. I'm, I'm really excited to hear the new music because I know it's been, you know, the last album I believe is like 2010, right? So it's, yeah. it's, it's been a while. So I know you've written all these amazing songs. So to hear something fresh from Brian Mello is exciting to me. So I'll, I'll be Thank in the you. loop when that comes out. Uh, I, I want to, commend you for your efforts for your podcast. I mean, you're, you're, you've created a platform, a safe space where people can come on and you, you honor them and you share their story and you, you spread the word and uh, it's, it's helping them to further, you know, their careers as well. If they have a new, if they have a, a show coming up or they have a new album coming out or a book, it's, it's, you're helping them fulfill their their dream as well and and sometimes we don't look at it that way but it's it's you're helping in more ways than you think um i i i want to also acknowledge you for all you've done for your community uh in hamilton you're you're running open mics i know you just started one you're giving local talent somewhere to develop their craft right and and they go on to do bigger and better things but they can't do that if they don't have the starting step. So doing the open mics and charity stuff and, you know, you're, you're, you don't hide the fact that you're from Hamilton. You're a proud, you know, proud uh, son of Hamilton and and Hamilton is proud that, that, that you're there with them. And, and last but not least, I want to uh, say thank you for sitting down with me twice now uh, to do the interview. Uh, we, we go way back. I've been a fan of yours and your music and uh, it means a lot to be able to pick your brain and, and to, to see what you're up to. And it inspires me to do better. So thank you, Brian. I really appreciate it. 
Joel, you're the best brother. You're the best man. Now, that, that, that really means a lot coming from you, man. And, uh, thank you. Uh, you inspire me as well. And you have, you've created that same platform for a lot of people on the podcast and it's beautiful to see. And, uh, um, we need more people like you, man, that, that are, that are hustling and, you know, showing that, uh, that dreams do come true if you work hard enough. So, so thank you for those kind words, man. I appreciate that. You're very welcome. Thank you, Brian, for your kind words to our listeners, uh, to the Brian Mello fans. Thanks for sticking with us for the last two hours and we'll see you on the next episode. If you've enjoyed today's episode of the podcast, please take a moment to subscribe, like comment and share. What I want to know is who would you like me to sit down with next for a two-hour deep dive interview? You can let me know by reaching out to me on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok at Joel Martin Mastery. Joel is J-O-E-L. And you can find me on Twitter and Snapchat at Joel Mastery. So I am done. I am complete. I approve this message. And I'll see you on the next episode. <laughs>